Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, we really tend to forget how important music is when it comes to driving the narrative of a film. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain on not only current projects, but how they got started, state of the business, so very, very much more. And uh, if you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, and we certainly hope that you do, um, you can do that over at Spotify, over at Apple, or you can find every single one of our episodes archived over at our YouTube channel uh, at In The Seats. And uh, if, if you'd like to follow us on social media for updates, that'd be great too. You can find us either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, please don't forget to join us over at InTheSeats.ca for all the latest and greatest movie news, interviews, reviews, and all sorts of fun stuff under the sun as our as our crack team is working hard. I'm working hard for you and uh, getting the joy of cinema out there in the world, which is what we're all about here at In The Seats. And uh, that's uh, much like uh, some of our friends, uh, because, you know, we love cinema and we love watching it at home, which is basically what we have to do right now. And uh, if uh, you find yourself uh, at home and sort of in need of uh, something that maybe isn't quite necessarily sort of on the your favorite streaming choice, uh, we'd recommend uh, checking out our friends over at Bay Street Video, if you live here in Toronto, over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario. They are open for uh, curbside and uh, mailing uh, sales, so that you can get stuff mailed to you, or you can schedule a curbside pickup appointment. You can uh, give them a call at 416-964-9088, or 416-964-9088, or email them at Bay Street Video TO at gmail.com for anything you might need, be it a last-minute Christmas present or just something to watch over the holidays as we all uh, try to stay as socially distant as humanly possible these days, which is such an important thing. But uh, we would love it very much if you would give them a call if there's anything on uh, DVD or Blu-ray that you might need to check out because they've got a huge selection, and I do highly recommend them. But... uh, now on to today's, well, this guest, um, there's several today, but uh, this would be the second of our Julians. This is Julian Schurl, who is a film composer. Specifically, we talked to him about his work on the new film, Princess of the Row, which has been uh, running through the festival circuit and playing in various places. And uh, we talked to him just not only about how he got involved in the film, but sort of what led him to composing and sort of the creative avenues that it opens up and just sort of the, uh, the all around experience of, you know, being involved in a film and how music sort of drives the narrative in some really specific ways. And, uh, he was a fascinating guy to talk to and we had fun and, uh, we hope you do too. Now, I mean, obviously, I guess my first, like, obviously congratulations. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful score, but I mean, I'm always kind of curious because there is a common misconception that f- people who do you know composing work are involved in the creative process from the get-go but i mean i i know it's always sort of varies from project to project i mean walk me through sort of when you got involved particularly with this film and just sort of how you sort of got jumped into it all right um so yeah as you said it, it's really project by project and sometimes you know you come on board and it's a lock cut and you have a lot of temp music and you sort of just you know distill it all out and create your own score based on that but with princess um i came on board really early so um the director is also the editor and um when i first met i think they i mean they were pretty far in their edit but they it was nothing close to being locked So um, I basically wrote um, a bunch of ideas, uh, like really loosely, not not even to picture, just ideas of like, here are the main story points, here are the main characters, here, you know, here's the main idea that we have for the score. And I gave um, stems, um, which is the subgroups of the of the piece of music. So you have, for instance, you know, uh, one instrument could be one stem or a percussion could be its own stem. 
you know, so it, very individual elements. And I gave that to um, the director. And as I said, he's also the editor. So he mm -hmm. was really good at, you know, taking these stems and rearranging them to picture. So um, it, it is a really long and awful process. <laughs> <because> it's <laughs> extremely, extremely time consuming because it, you know, you, you, you just go through so many different things and like 50, 60% of what you write might not even end up in the movie, you know? So um, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty nice experiment and we didn't have any uh, restraints in terms of timeline. So it was not like a hard um, delivery date. It was more like, yeah, should we do festival run this year or just push it another year? And everyone was, you know, like, let's just focus on doing something cool that everyone enjoys doing. Um, so we had a really long timeline um, and I was, yeah, I was basically just constantly writing different ideas, different pieces of music. And slowly we settled on a handful of themes. And then I, I focused on these and gave some different options for, uh, for, for these scenes. And um, yeah, so all in all, I think the whole process was over a year for the score, okay. which is really long. Um, you know, so usually, you know, a month, two months is, is usually like the range um, that, that you have time to write a score. And in this case, you know, um, especially because we did create everything, everything from scratch, all the instruments I built from scratch, I sampled all the instruments. It was wow. really, really time consuming. Um, and then, yeah, when, once that phase was done and I sent him all the stems and he arranged it, Sometimes he took a stem from one cue and combined it with a completely different cue. So, you know, it's a really cool collaboration in the sense that, you know, I was not only uh, replacing temp music, I was really um, able to embed, you know, the right. music as a part of the story and a part of the characters and had both, you know, the, the edit and the score basically develop at the same time. So uh, it, was, it was, you know, as I said, every project is different. And for this one, it, it sort of offered that, you know, very, um, very cool opportunity to have that type of collaboration. One, I mean, I would imagine, especially when it comes down to composing music, you would have to be sort of very flexible to the situation. I mean, I'm always kind of curious how that sort of alters the creative process. I mean, I imagine in your line of work, you've got to be sort of working 24-7, 365 in case you get a phone call of going, I need something in two weeks. What do you have? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, yeah, it's, you have to be, you have to be very flexible. That's, that's, yeah, you, I mean, but that, that's also kind of going hand in hand with, uh, you know, how my brain works and how my general workflow is, you know, I'm, I'm not, composing for me is not a job. It's, it's who I am and what I am. You know, once I'm on a project, like my whole head is really in that project. So it doesn't feel like, uh, like work nor intrusive if the director email or calls me at like eight, eight in the evening. It's like, hey, I have this idea, you know, in, in the same way I can call him and like, I don't know, 10 in the evening. It's like, hey, I have another <laughs> idea. Let's try this. You know. So um, yeah, it's not it it if if you kind of, if you would see it as um, you know as a job, then I don't know, you 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 don't um, you don't I don't think you, you can um, free up that type of energy and resources for such a long time if you see it as a job. Mm -hmm. You know, this this specific project was also everyone who was involved. Um, just poured so much energy and love into it that you know it was it's very, very easy to also get on that train of like this really let's try something cool and different and you know um, like just follow that that type of energy that this project had. What uh, what ultimately got you into film composing? Because I mean, it is I like as a film fan. I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a sucker for some of those more iconic scores that are out there in the, in the in the world. Like, what was it about sort of this making this type of music that appealed to you? Um. So I I've been 
doing music since I can think. Um, and uh, I remember a, a specific moment, I think it was like eight, nine, nine, eight, 10 years old around that time, I saw uh, The Fifth Element. Okay. Um, and Eric Serrat wrote the music for that. And um, I remember I saw it and I listened to the music and it was just so different than anything that I ever heard that I um, had, I had, you know, I did a um, USB flash drive and I came to my piano teacher and was like, I want to do that type of music. And she's like, there's no piano in it. I can't teach you anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I, from, from the get go, I was just, um, really uh drawn towards um music that i don't know tells stories and is um doing something that is not just i don't know falling into categories you know like if if you if you become a classical composer you have you know you have one style that basically that you have to or sort of that you that you compose in similar to a musician, you know, if you establish yourself as an artist, um, you sort of fall into a certain style and you kind of follow that style and, you know, you gain some popularity and then you're kind of locked into that style. And with film music, um, you sort of reinvent yourself as a musician each time you sign on to a new project. Okay. So, um, just the sheer uh, variety of of styles and genres that you can do is amazing and that I think that's the, that's the probably that's the main reason why I slowly I don't know get got closer to I, I didn't really think about you know writing music in the beginning um, I was more interested in in um, sound design okay um, because it felt um, that a lot of the scores sort of just use a already learned repertoire of, um, of, of certain key elements and you put, you put, you know, it kind of, it, it's almost, you know, you, you can easily fall into write, writing something that already existed and that was sort of generic and kind of on the nose, you know, having like a big hero theme at a hero sequence or a sad right. thing. that's really like emotion on emotion off kind of you know button type right. of scoring. um and with sound design um i felt like it's a it's a more new territory that was that that could be explored and you could create emotions in a more subtle way than doing that with music so that was you know initially i i was more into sound design and then um, I slowly realized that you can apply the same mindset to music as well and, you know, create scores that are more subtle and supportive um, rather than, you know, dictating how, you, how you're supposed to feel in certain scenes. It really feels like sort of film scoring. And I mean, even as an extension of that, sound design is, is might be one of the last bastions of, sort of a really sort of freeing kind of creativity because I mean especially in the world of film scores we see a lot of different sort of you know established rock stars and people sort of getting into that business because they can do something different and I mean what is it about sort of the creative element of scoring film that sort of allows this kind of freedom for musicians to be musicians and not just play sort of, like you say, something in the formula that people are used to. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, um, it, you, you, you kind, I mean, of course you have to follow um, whatever the story is. And right. You have, yeah. You know, um, you, you can, I mean, you, you could, if it, if it's your movie and if you're financing it, uh, financing of course, it, right. <laughs> it um, but yeah, it's definitely, it, it, because it's, you know, you have such a, um, I don't know, you, you have such a wide range of what you can do, you know, what you, what you can get away with um, as long as you capturing um, the right emotions um, that yeah you know, it's it's a very artistically it's a very fulfilling um, area and I mean I'm I'm still writing music just for myself um, that's 
you know, I think that's also ultimately that's the the most fulfilling um, path you can go down is to just don't don't give a don't give any uh, value to anyone else's opinion and just write whatever you want to write. You could say it. Don't give a fuck. Write what you want to write. It's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, just, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's the, the ideal. Um, but yeah, the, the other aspect that I really like about film scoring is that it's, um, it's a collaboration with other um, artists, you know, so you, you, you still have a lot of freedom and ideally you find, you know, a director and a producer that gives you that artistic freedom and just trusts you. Um, but um, basically creating something out of, out of nothing, you know, coming up with a story and then turning it into something that you can actually see and it's performed by, by, um, by actors. And then, you know, from the musical side, basically doing the same thing, creating uh, a concept for the score and creating these characters and creating themes for these characters and different textures for you know different settings and and setups um is yeah i think that's that's just a really fulfilling process you know to to go through that with other people well and it allows you to sort of transcend mediums as well and sort of combine everything into the one which is what movie making really is and it's it's yeah. it's kind of a beautiful collaborative art that you know we we tend to take for granted in so many ways because it does take a village to make everything work in concert without the score this scene might not play exactly the, the the right way if it's the wrong cinematographer and he shot it wrong then the effect won't be the same it's all married together and it's a really interesting blend yeah and you don't know if it works or not until you really, you know, on the on the stage and you watch the final thing, <laughs> you have no idea. You know, it could be, it could be great, it could be boring. You don't know. You just, you know, you, you just have to give your best and and I don't know, hope that everything comes together and you know creates that magic where you know the the sum is more than the the individual pieces well that's the thrill of creation too right you you never really know until you sort of throw it out into the universe and then see if it sticks or not right right and then i mean it, it's also you know you you release it and then it's out in the world and every can everyone can judge it and watch it and you know hopefully it re resonates with some people and hopefully you know some some people are moved by it um, I, I think always for me, um, you know, um, hearing that um, that a movie affected someone and made them think differently about their world that surrounds them, that's that's for me. That's the that's a real big reward, you know, like being sit seeing sitting in in a movie theater with other people and you know, I I usually because I've seen the movie a million times, you know, so yeah. I don't really have to watch it. I like to watch everyone else, <laughs> <laughs> like kind of, kind of watch and see how they react, and you know if they're moved, then great. Um, and I, I remember for the first screening of Princess, um, I overheard some people talk, and someone was like, "Wow, this was really powerful. I think I'm gonna call my dad, <laughs> <laughs> reconnect to my dad." And I was like, "Wow, yeah, that's that's great." Um, we 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 managed to um, yeah have have people act, you know, and um, yeah, I think in, in general, you know, I, I do like the I idea or I like to be aware of the, how powerful movies can be and how powerful, uh, you know, that, that whole me form of medium can be. Um, and I, I feel like we do have some sort of a responsibility to give some, you know, food for thought and something, you know, try, try to make this, this place a little bit better, you know, and, and for and sure. Yeah. Give, give people thoughts and like, you know, hopefully have them open up to certain worlds or um, cultures that, you know, they, they wouldn't be really in touch with. And, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever been to Skid Row, but it is a really, uh, it's really depressing to mm. see you know that it exists and it's like if you if you start talking to people 
it i mean it's really heartbreaking to hear you know the stories behind and you know why people ended up there no for sure it's 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 one of those things that everything needs to be working together to really sort of get the power of the story across and i'm just kind of curious from your perspective because i love how you mentioned sound design before and i'm kind of curious how do you think scoring and sound design can push the medium of sort of visual storytelling that is filmmaking um so i would i would say um sound and specifically music um i mean you you can you use it to sell certain environments, mm -hmm. of course, um, but um, it also sort of represents the soul of a of a movie. Yeah. Um, so, you know, of, of a good a good soundtrack, I, I should say. Um, it it really, um, you know, if you if you read a book, you have um, the thoughts of the character. You have the internal monologue that that people have you have different types of describing you don't have that in movie in movies um so in in a way um to me sound and music um brings back that that layer of um uh of of setting certain things that you experience visually in a context emotionally so you know you can contrast it you can support it you know you, you can do a whole lot of different things you can like a, a thought that you in um that you um introduced early in the movie you can bring that back throughout different scenes so mm -hmm. the audience sort of has you know this gets refers back to different emotions that were already in the scene and so on you know it, it's uh, I, I should i should add that's another thing that i um very interested in and that I was always very interested in is uh, psychology and I think that music in a way can tell a lot of the psychology behind the development of the characters um, so yeah I mean it's you know as they say it's 50% of, of the movie is the sound you know for sure for sure all. now and I mean I'm always kind of curious because especially with composing and i mean like you say you have to just be writing music constantly and you have to be writing it for yourself can there be sort of like for you sort of a dream project one day or is it just a question of hoping that your right piece of music will match up with the right person making the right visuals at the right time um yeah i mean the you know i think uh it's hard to pinpoint down um uh, a dream project. I think f for me, the definition of a dream project would be, you know, it's, it's creatively um, uh, just, I don't know, inspiring. I, you know, if, if I, if I watch something, if I watch a scene or a cut or read a um, screenplay and I'm getting excited about it, that's already, you know, that's pointing in, in a good direction. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just um, having, projects that I would watch myself and be excited about if I would see it in a theater and come out of like, wow, this is awesome. You know, I think that's, uh, it's, it's not connected to, um, to budgets. I mean, obviously, you know, if, if you have more budget, you have more freedom, um, uh, not, not creative freedom. I'm saying you have more, more freedom, uh, in terms of, you know, creating something that's, uh, that, that has a higher production value because you can, you know, you can hire musicians, you can hire orchestra, you, you can have more time, you can shoot something that looks better, you have a better edit and so on. Um, so, yeah, I think the, you know, having um, both a creatively challenging and fulfilling aspect, and then also a story and um, aesthetic that I would, want to watch myself i think that's that combination that would be kind of my dream project now and i mean this might be a silly question but i mean i'm just always curious about it because especially from a public standpoint the the 
the concept of film scoring is being in these big rooms with orchestras and like all these people playing different instruments. I'm kind of curious for you, like what's sort of the most amount of different like sort of instruments and players you've used on a piece and what's the least? Because I mean, it can kind of go both ways depending on sort of the scene, the moment, sort of the atmosphere that you're, you're trying to create. Right, um, so I, I would say um, all, all of these different ways of scoring um, and tapping into the, these different type of resources, that's, you know, I, I would say that's all different tools. Yeah. And for, for each setup and feeling and, you know, how, how you want to make, make the audience feel, you know, if you want to be very intimate, uh, intimate or if you want to, you know, have like a very powerful, um, grand kind of feel, um, all this is, you know, it's kind of translating that into the way how you, you know, you, how you approach the production and the arrangement and the instrumentation. Um, and then, of course, also, again, budget, you know, hiring an orchestra, you know, is, is not cheap. Not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if it's just me, it's cheaper. Right. Um, so, yeah, I... I you know, it, it, that's always something that I talk about very early on in, in the project of like how, what kind of sound are we going after? And if, you know, if the producer or the director is like, yeah, I want this, you know, big orchestral uh, feel to it, but I have no money for it, then I'm like, it, you know, you, you just can't, you can't do that. Yeah, you can try to do like, you know, samples and stuff, but, um, not it's not gonna do that job um so you know if they want that feel then of course you know they need to we need to talk about budgeting that and you know hiring an orchestra and yeah i i my my smallest projects is basically me i mean i i um I am not, uh, I don't really have the time to practice a lot uh, of my, I, uh, you know, back in the day when I, um, when I studied, um, I had more time to practice. <laughs> Definitely was, uh, um, was better um, at playing uh, more virtual stuff. But now I, you know, I still play guitar. I play piano. I have played piano for my whole life and I do play it at a cello. I'm really into synths. So, you know, that also helped having piano lessons. Um, and um, so, yeah, I can, I can create a whole score by myself. I can, you know, I can do um, a little bit of textural strings, you know, so I can do it all, but that's, it's a very specific feel, you know, and if it fits it, great. Um, and the biggest one was, uh, the last project I did, um, we recorded orchestra. It was a 60 piece orchestra. Um, it was very exciting. I, I think it's again, you know, the, the more people you collaborate with, the, the cooler it is at the end because you really, you know, you, you write something and you give it to other professionals and they perform it. So, you know, having um, musicians that, you know, practice their instrument their entire life that's yeah they're absolute great at it better than i could ever be because you know i just, just don't have yeah, i just have one life <laughs> you know i, I can uh, only focus on so much so having other people play it you know and being really good at it um is uh is, that's another a beautiful moment like going and recording orchestra and you know having your music and of course it's already it's all demoed so you know kind of how it will sound but then having real musician play it is a whole different level it's it's every time you know when 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 someone someone asks me you know should we is it worth recording orchestra is it worth recording strings the i mean it's hands down it's absolute yes the just the, you know, all you do with music is communicating emotion and playing set string samples, for instance, just cannot create that type of emotion that, you know, professional, professionally trained musicians, if they play it, um, it, it just adds that, that last bit of emotional, emotionality that you just can't fake. And you can fake a lot, you know, but 
specifically strings is just yeah you can't well and I, I mean just to put a bow on all this i mean i've got to imagine that's probably the more sort of creatively satisfying end of the business because i mean especially in the entertainment business there's going to be jobs where you're being creative and you're very satisfied but there's going to be other jobs where it's a job and they want something in two weeks and just you have to let it go and I'm kind of curious, from your perspective, as someone who is always composing and creating and writing music, how do you ultimately sort of let it go, especially in those moments where you may not necessarily be 100% happy with it? Right. Um, so I think what, what's very important, and I, I think every, every creative um, sort of struggles with that, um, you know, no, nobody likes critique. Um, yeah. And no, nobody likes to be uh, refused. And I think it's, you know, creating music um, uh, in, in itself is, is an extremely personal experience. Mm. You, know, you sit down with your instrument and you create something and it comes out of you. It's for me, you know, I, I kind of empty myself completely and then some, you know, something comes right. through. It, it's a really, really personal process. But that being said, um, that's not why you get hired. You get hired because um, whoever whoever brings you onto this project believes that you can execute something that will suit their vision. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, the first step of like creating this is still extremely personal, but then you just have to be aware you're not creating it for yourself. You mm -hmm. do the best to your ability to create something that supports, you know, that story or that vision of, of, the, of the director. It's not your movie. I mean, in a way it is your movie. Right, yeah. And, and I, that, that's also, you know, again, referring back to um, finding people that you creatively really flow and really have similar visions because then you have less of the um of of that having to let go and right be able to you know have your vision um and a lot of the times you know you write something and um you give it away and then you get feedback and you know everyone has different taste um but a lot of the times if you if you work with the right people what they come back with makes it better. It's not making it, it, it's not destroying your your piece of work. And if it does, then, you know, you have to just, you have to go with it because, you know, it's not, you're, you're hired to give them what they want. You're not hired to, you know, write something that you want, you know? So you, you definitely have to be, yeah, you have to be fairly flexible um, with that and just be, you know, aware that, you you you're hired to do something for someone else and it's not ultimately it's not yours you can just you know do what whatever you can no for no. sure but i mean i'm glad something like princess really does like and you can feel sort of uh, the positive sort of proper creative energy out of your score especially with princess and i just want to say thank you for the work and thank you for the time today man this was fun yeah thank you so much and don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.